If you have been to New Orleans, you know how culturally rich that town is and how influential role food plays in the rich history of town. Town is the epicenter of the testament of any culture, although there is a very short period of time when the food of the area suffered a really bad name due to the actions of a man that is no way related to New Orleans food culture. It all began when this young social media guy who called himself an internet celebrity came barging into the Melita Diner and ordered the menu. The server greeted him. How are you? And what would you like to have today? The man quick with enthusiasm said, I would like to order your whole menu, please. After preparing the big meal in an hour and a half, they charged the bill and the guy refused to pay it saying that he wants to get sponsored by them and instead will promote the diner in place of paying for all the food that he ordered. He said, look, I am a celebrity. I got 2 million subscribers on YouTube and I can help you get this place boom up. To which the server said you would have to ask the owner and to which the owner came and he refused the offer since the bill was around $699 worth of food. He said to the man, thank you for the offer, but I don't want the promotion. The man who ordered the meal said, you sponsor me and you get the goods. The owner said, no, we would like you to pay the bill like everyone else. The man was getting derailed and angry. You could have just sponsored me and we would have gotten over everything. Now I am just going to make sure no one comes to your diner. As he said, the owner politely said, do what you feel, just pay the bill and leave. Since the establishment refused to do so, and that pissed him off, and there was confrontation between the owners and him, until eventually he getting kicked out of the place, and that led to him making a video where he did accuse the place of being mean, unkind, and abusive to him, and that they tried to make him pay after calling him, and agreed about the sponsorship, and having the following he had, he made sure to convey the message loud and clear to the wide audience he had. He made the typical YouTube video and said, Hey guys, I was recently assaulted at this little diner, Melita. I ordered the food at the diner, and they said that they would like to get a shout out. But as soon as I did, they also said that I should also pay the bill that they charged me extra. And they even added items that I did not order. Now I don't want to sound petty and obstruct their business, but if I was a sensible person, I wouldn't go their place. Sooner, the video reached the establishment and the influence of that internet person was enough to affect the business. People believed the story of that phony celebrity, and the business started suffering. People were making up stories on how the staff was bad, and even to an extent tried vandalizing the place, and were constantly posting updates on social media, saying the place was really bad and rude. The regulars kept coming to the place, but that was it. Since the part of town was old, there were only few old-timers that truly knew how amazing that place was, but there weren't enough old-timers to testament the dignity of the place, and the place that stood strong for almost a century was now on verge of being closed because of a greedy guy. Alonzo was on the verge of closing the place up, the place that had been serving up the neighborhood for years, even though he did not want to. Not knowing what to do, a guy named Billy, who was an old regular, told Alonzo to meet up with Lady Danielle, and she can bring him the very solution that he needs. At first, he was skeptic of going to a shaman, but then Billy said that it worked wonders for everyone and he should give it a try. Alonzo was desperate and knew that it had to be done. His place was snatched away, and he needed to take down the guy who did it. It was then that Lady Danielle, along with Alonzo, who was the owner of the place, decided to put a curse on the guy. Now, Lady Danielle never put bad curse, but sometimes when she thinks someone has been unjust, she puts one. She decided to wait for the right time, and she found it during one of her lives. During one of the live feed of the mukbang, Lady Danielle and Alonzo, the owner of the diner, put a curse on him, and as he ate, they mimicked the food he ate with a voodoo doll, and instead of good food, they stuffed the doll with rotten insects and old dust and bones and disgusting things that cannot be comprehended. The premiere looked normal, and it was over. Alonzo, being a skeptic, did not think that the curse worked. 
it wasn't until a week later when the news broke that the mukbang creator died because of eating stale, greasy, and unhealthy food. His heart was blocked. But the one thing that was surprising was finding things that humans normally don't eat in his body. The contents of his stomach revealed that he ate cockroaches, rats, human feces, head of a crow, squirrel meat, though it is not known that he ever ate that or not. But these contents that were revealed are the same content that Lady Danielle and Alonzo fed the voodoo doll. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. I got an offer to be a commie chef at a garden festival in Frodsham, which is basically a really posh rural part of Cheshire. The gig was offering posh nosh with all the mobility of the burger van, and since the company involved was offering a rather generous way to pay for just a weekend's work, I couldn't exactly afford to turn it down. So on the day in question, I drove out the fridge and parked my car up and start looking around for the food service facility. They look quite nice from the outside, and the guys on the line look like they are having a right good laugh. But when I actually got to grips with the service, I started to see how the catering company had tried to cut as many corners as possible to maximize profits. I honestly couldn't go into it without boring the life out of you with all with chef speak. So I'll just tell you one thing that really mattered. Most of the kitchens I've worked in lay grip mats down in places that can get particularly slippery, a basic health and safety measure that becomes bog standard across the catering industry. But not only was there not a single grip mat in that entire kitchen, but whatever they used for flooring was extremely slippery once it came in contact with even the smallest amount of liquid. And it wasn't long until the entire place became a giant big bloody death trap. The whole thing came to a head when there was a horrendous accident involving a plate of hot duck fat, but didn't see what happened. Oh my god did I hear it. But it was this clattering of pots and pans, followed by this absolute blood-curdling scream. I'd honestly never heard anything like it in all my years of professional cooking. From what I understand, someone slipped and fell into something. Both guys went down with one grabbing the handle of a saucepan on the way. The saucepan happened to be full of hot duck fat that was being used to make the comfy ham hot boiling, burning, sticky duck fat that clung to that poor guy's face. The wounds were absolutely horrendous, like his skin was peeling and blistering in sections, and I think some of the fat got into one of his eyes, because he kept saying, I can't see, I can't bloody see. Actually, you know what? They look like a horror movie makeup, like the practical effects you see from 80s and 90s gore fests, and the fact that it was real. It was his actual skin. Christ, it made me queasy thinking about it even all these years later. That was Saturday afternoon, only about four or five hours into service. I've never walked out on the job before, ever, but I walked off that one. All it took was the head chef telling me to bloody get on with it when I told him how dire it was in the kitchen. If I was just some novice having a flap about nothing Fair dues. This was serious. That guy was carted off to a hospital in an ambulance with the word skin engrafted being thrown around. And there's the head chef telling me to just crack on with it. Nice chance, mate. Someone had suffered life-changing injuries on that line, and nobody gave a toss because all they were thinking about was their wallets. But I'll tell you what, that means it hurt all the more when that bloke took them to court and got a booster settlement from it. But seeing how little anyone cared, that was the scary part. People really are the worst whenever money's involved. I never thought that I'd have anything to post on the subreddit. But here we go. This literally just happened. So I had to try to keep this as short and as organized as possible. My 29-year-old female and my partner is a 23-year-old female. We were back in her own town visiting her family for about a week. It's a very small, isolated town in the middle of nowhere, and basically in the middle of the woods. 
While we were here, she wanted to meet up with an old high school friend who still lives in the area. We'll call him Kyle. So we meet Kyle at the beach, and right away he's acting super weird, making jokes about a three-way with us and just making a bunch of just unwelcome, gross comments. Obviously, we're unfortunately used to this stuff to a certain extent, but coming from someone who is supposed to be her good friend, it was extra annoying. So my girlfriend and I are shooting each other panic looks the whole time. Once he's out of earshot for a second, she says that she's sorry, that he's never been like this before, and we can make an excuse to leave. When he comes back, we tell him we want to get dinner at a local bar but he just asked to join us. We felt awkward, so we end up saying yes. He says he doesn't know quite how to get there, so he follows us. We get their order drinks and food, then head out to the patio with the drinks. He makes a few more gross comments, but it's generally been way more cool and normal than he was at the beach. We're smoking some weed on the patio and chilling. The food comes quick and we finish it quicker. Now, here's where it gets really messed up. So halfway through my first drink, I'm feeling really tired, which makes sense, as we've had a long day. I give my girlfriend the signal that I wanna go. She makes an excuse that we need to go. He keeps trying to get us to come to his house. I've got some good weed and dives there and you can meet my cats, blah, blah, blah. He's being really pushy. We keep saying no and making excuses. We need to check on her grandpa, etc. So finally we get in the car and say goodnight. We park next to each other and walk up and into the cars together while saying our goodbyes. And we get into the car. My girlfriend informs me that she wants to stay at the bar, but fake it like we're leaving because she doesn't want to chill with them anymore, understandably. So we're sitting in the car waiting for him to leave first when he signals for us to roll down the window. We do. He says GPS has been kind of funny, and we can lead him to the main road? To be fair, we're in the middle of nowhere, so this didn't seem too outlandish. So obviously, staying behind at the bar was out of the question. So in the car, we were talking about how pushy was being, and she admitted she feels weird driving right back to her grandpa's house. So we should drive into town until we lose him. He's behind this for a long time even way after he should have gotten off on his exit. We think it's weird, but we weren't sure what to do. So finally, we get on a two-lane road, and he pulls up next to us and he's waving a phone which is clearly my girlfriend's phone in the window. We pull over, he gives her the phone back, chats for just a few seconds, then leaves in a hurry. Here is the part that makes my skin crawl. We know we had her phone. I saw her put it in her fanny pack, which was on the table, along with my phone and her butt. A few minutes before we left the bar as we were preparing to leave, she didn't take it back out. There's literally no way she could have left at the bar. More importantly, he got in his car and left the bar at the same time as us, meaning he had to have already had the phone when we were leaving. It's not like we left the bars first and he saw it left on the table or something. He literally handled it and walk into the cars with us and calmly said goodnight with the phone already in his possession. Now, the kicker, apparently unbeknownst to me, my girlfriend had tasted a very weird bitter taste in her straw at the bar and was already suspicious, especially with how he's been acting. This is why she wanted to stay back at the bar to get away from him and stay in public where she felt it was safer. So when he walked up to the car to return her cell phone, she very casually and deliberately flashed the knife that she kept for protection in her jacket. I didn't know at the time that she had done this. So that's why he had left so quickly. Obviously, I was annoyed with her for not telling me her suspicions sooner. But she just didn't want me to panic. I'm really shaken up. A few things are clear. One, he stole my girlfriend's phone. And it seems like he did so so that he would be forced to pull over on a dark road in the middle of nowhere 
till he quickly ended the conversation and left when my girlfriend flashed her knife. They'd been good friends for almost 10 years. If he wasn't planning on doing something malicious, I feel like he would have acted confused about the knife or said something like, what's up? Why would you flash a knife at me? Is this as some sort of bad movie or something? But instead, he just booked it. Which tells me he knew exactly what she was doing, reacting to a threat and preparing to protect herself and me. And three, he probably spiked our drinks. My girlfriend noticed a weird taste in her straw right away and chose not to finish her drink. I finished half my drink and I felt relatively tired. A few more things. I just don't know how he managed to nab the phone without us noticing or knowing it doesn't really make any sense. But he did. Me and my girlfriend both remember her putting it in her fanny pack perfectly. We almost had no idea how he could have spiked our drinks unless he was working with the bartender. But we were the ones who suggested that bar. I don't know exactly how he did it. But I think I know why. And for that reason, my girlfriend's now ex-friend, who made creepy comments, probably tried to drug us and stole her phone in order to get us alone the dark road. Please keep your distance. <laughs>